We just finished a great web chat on pericardial diseases with Dr. Alan Klein, who is the director of our uh, Center for the Diagnosis and Treatment of Pericardial Diseases at the Cleveland Clinic. Those are always a great web chat. We always get a lot of questions about pericardial disease. And one of the um, biggest questions were all about the medications, obviously, like what do you choose first, second, and third line medications? Can you talk about that? Sure. Uh, thanks, Betsy. Um, that always comes up when we see these patients. Uh, there are European guidelines that outline uh, step one, step two, three, and four. So step one for acute or recurrent pericarditis usually involves the NSAIDs, which is either aspirin, or ibuprofen, or naproxen. Um, often we have exercise restriction. Second line would be uh, low-dose steroids. Third line would be the newer agents, the DMARDs, such as azathioprine, methotrexate, um, or um, anakinra. And fourth line would be actually surgery, a pericardiectomy. We are offering our patients um, a pericardiectomy once these cases become uh, very resistant after several years. Um, so that would be the, the stepwise approach to pericarditis. Uh, another question that we had was, how do you know when to add a drug? How do you follow the patients? Yeah. In our practice here at Cleveland Clinic at our uh, pericardial center, um, we, uh, we put them on a certain therapy and we ask them to check the inflammatory markers every two to four weeks. Which inflammatory markers? Often we look at CRP, C-reactive protein, or the ultra-sensitive or high-sensitivity CRP, which may be a little more sensitive, uh, and the uh, WS or SED rate. Uh, so we give them a um, sort of a recipe to, um, based on how they're feeling and the inflammatory markers. And based on that, we will taper whether it's the prednisone, the ibuprofen, or colchicin. It takes a quite a long time. Uh, if you go too quick, uh, you'll definitely precipitate a relapse. The biggest mistake I see is that um, most physicians undertreat these patients. So they, they give them medicine for a week or two, and then they, they, they gradually or quickly stop the medicine, and then it relapses. Mm -hmm. So it's a very gradual process. And how important are some of the imaging tests that you do, like MRI and uh, other echocardiogram in this process? For a, for a routine case of acute or recurrent pericarditis, um, often you don't have to do um, much uh, advanced imaging. Uh, echo is always first line for uh, any of these tests. and. It will often show a pericardial fusion, constrictive physiology, or may actually be normal. For um, complicated pericarditis, multiple relapses, um, steroid dependent, colchicine dependent, we often have to go to more advanced imaging. And that includes, for echo, we often do strain imaging to see if the uh, myocardium is tethered from the pericardium. MRI is very, very powerful. Um, it's a, basically an imaging biomarker that tells us a few things. It tells us how acute the, the case is, whether you actually have pericarditis. 10% of the patients that claim they have pericarditis don't have pericarditis. Uh, it tells us how inflamed things are, how long it's going to take for treatment, how fast the taper, and their prognosis. So it's a very powerful tool. I should mention that um, most centers do not have a, a pericarditis protocol, so I think it's important to go to a center that has this. Um, for, uh, to, to, uh, for these, uh, to, to evaluate these patients. Mm -hmm. uh, we always get a lot of questions about exercise and how that impacts pericarditis, what you should know about that. Um, in the uh, European guidelines, they do have a section on exercise. Uh, basically, they say to limit exercise when you're having uh, active um, pericarditis. Uh, usually they say for uh, recurrent pericarditis for athletes, at least, um, at least three months. Um, of um, no active exercise, uh, we tell our patients to, to limit the um, heart rate, to uh, have a heart rate less than 100. And I, I seem to joke about that, like, like walking a dog. Um, hopefully your dog doesn't walk too fast, but usually the heart rate less than 100. Uh, we observe people that who go on a treadmill, go for a run or bike 30, 40 miles will have a recurrence. So I think um, the, the pericardium has to heal. It takes quite a long time. 
Uh, but actually, we're, we're going to do a randomized trial, Betsy, mm -hmm. here at the clinic. Uh, half the patients will tell you can continue what they're doing, and the half will uh, be limited in their exercise. We we'll want to follow them with a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, and we'll see the number of recurrences, time to recurrences, severity of recurrences. So this will actually be a very important uh, trial uh, to ascertain whether exercise um, um, aggravates the uh, pericarditis. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of research, it sounds like you do have a lot of different trials that you're doing related to pericarditis. Can you talk about what the future will bring with this? Well, actually, it's a very exciting um, um, era for pericarditis. Uh, I think it was like a new renaissance. Mm -hmm. It's an old disease, but now we have, first of all, the uh, precision type drugs, the biologics, things like anakinra, anakinra um, which is an interleukin receptor blocker, or a drug called Rolonicept, which is, a, being a, which is in a study. Um, so these drugs are actually very important. So we're actually doing a, um, a national study, uh, a pilot that's uh, almost done, and we're about to start a, a pivotal trial, which will be international. I'm actually going to be the national PI for this, uh, rolling patients um, in the U.S. and around the world that have uh, multiple um, episodes of recurrent pericarditis. Uh, and they would have to come in with an actual flare with an elevated CRP. And these, uh, these drugs are very, very important because uh, patients do respond after one or two doses. Mm -hmm. Their CRP decreases. So this is a very exciting um, um, arena. In addition, we are doing, as I mentioned, the exercise trial. We're also doing a genetic study to, um, to ask permission from patients to draw uh, extra blood, to analyze it, to see if there's a genetic mutation um, in, in the future. Uh, and more and more um, interest in the uh, in industry uh, to uh, fund these type trials. Mm -hmm. But so a lot of excitement. Yes, we have a lot to learn still. A lot, <laughs> a lot to learn. To learn. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times in these chats, people have just been frustrated by long-term treatment. They have tried different things and things aren't working. When should somebody actually see a pericardi pericarditis center or specialist? Um, that's a good question. Um, the patients that we see are, are, are quite uh, re resistant to their usual therapy. Um, I think there's a big education gap in the community. Uh, a lot of um, primary doctors or cardiologists are not that um, attuned to treating pericarditis. So I think um, people with complicated pericarditis, often the ones that are multiple recurrences, uh, the ones that are frustrated with a lot of medicines, a lot of side effects, uh, or the ones that just want to know their prognosis should, should come see a, um, a specialist at the pericardial center. And as I mentioned, we, we do have a team mm -hmm. of uh, physicians. Uh, we are uh, well connected with our rheumatologists, our surgeons. We are doing a lot of research protocols. So a lot, a lot going on to, to help these patients. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for our web chat. You know that our listeners really appreciate all the information that you give them and the support that you provide. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.